the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah wrote about the religious conditions that prevailed during the days in which they prophesied. And in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 and 10, the prophet said, This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. The words of Jeremiah are also very similar to those in that he says in Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, an astonishing and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means and my people love to have it so. And then it was in chapter 6 that Jeremiah as a prophet of Almighty God presented a challenge to the nation of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. It is the case that back during the days of the prophets, that in general the people were not interested in hearing the word of God. They were not interested in hearing Isaiah's message, Isaiah prophesied to those people. You read of the vision that he was shown from God in Isaiah chapter 6. And the Godhead asked, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then Isaiah responded, Here am I, Lord. Send me. During the course of the conversation between himself and the Godhead, Isaiah asked the question, How long, O Lord? How long shall I... Prophesy thy word, speak thy word unto a rebellious people. Then God's answer was, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the lands without men, and the houses or the lands be utterly desolate. They were not interested in Jeremiah's message, and it discouraged that great prophet of God to the point that he decided at one point, I'll not speak any more in his name. Then he said in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, His word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not contain. The Scriptures make it very clear in the New Testament that there was going to be a departure from the truth of God's word. Paul was speaking to the elders of the Lord's church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, beginning with verse 29, and he said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. We also read Paul's words to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Paul said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Paul also wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we do know that in the centuries immediately following the close of the apostolic age, that there was in fact a departure from the truth. But then we know that in the late 1700s and throughout the 1800s, there were men who were members of various sectarian groups who began to examine the teachings and the practices of those denominations that existed during that day. They began to see that there were many things that were being taught that simply was not found in the Word of God. They began to see that there were many practices that were not rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word. And so they began to call out for men to go back to the Word of God, come out of these religious sects and go back to the Word of God to the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Their intent was not 
to establish a new church, but rather was to go back and to restore the church that we read about in the New Testament. We read about men and know about men from history such as Alexander Campbell and Barton W. Stone and Raccoon John Smith and others who call for those people to simply go back to the Word of God. Men had left the Word of God. They were teaching the traditions of men much like the Pharisees were doing in Matthew chapter 15 verses 7 through 9. They were practicing things that you simply could not find these practices in the Scripture. And so there was a phrase that was coined during the years of the Restoration Movement. We speak where the Bible speaks, and we are silent where the Bible is silent. We do Bible things in Bible ways. We call Bible things by Bible names. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The idea being set by the inspired pensman of God is that when I preach, I am to preach the Word of Almighty God. Not in my opinion. Not what men think the Word of God teaches. Not men's ideas about the Word of God. But what does the Bible teach? Now, during the years of the Restoration Movement, there were several principles that were followed in calling men back to the Bible. And that's what I want us to think about for just a few moments this morning. And let me tell you something. Even today, when we call people back to the Word of God and when we issue the challenge, let's go back to the New Testament. Let's go back to the Word of God and to look at the New Testament church as it was revealed in the pages of the New Testament. Let's look at that. And let's teach what they taught and practice what they taught. Practice what they practiced. These same principles have to be followed today. First of all, we must go back to the old guide. We must go back to the old guide. Man needs divine guidance. There's no doubt about that. Man did not leave it up to man to choose his own method of salvation or to choose his own way of serving God. We read in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, for it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And that acknowledgement that man needs divine guidance is just as true today as when these words were first penned. True religion is always based upon divine revelation not upon what man's thought may be. It is always to be based upon a thus saith the Lord. Now, Jesus Christ promised divine guidance to His apostles. He did not leave it up to them to make up their own message as they went along. He gave them the guidance that they needed. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said to His apostles, When they shall deliver you up, Take no thought what you shall say or what you shall speak in that same hour. For it shall be given you in that hour what you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you or speaketh through you. And so they came to understand that they were going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus told them in John chapter 16 and verse 13. The Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. Now when Paul began preaching the Gospel of Christ, he also received the very same guidance that the other apostles did. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, he said to his Galatian brethren, I certify you, brethren, that the Gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither was I taught it, but neither came it to me by man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He received the very same guidance that the other apostles did. And so, when the apostles went out to preach and teach, their message would be without error. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now when Paul penned these words, he set forth three great truths about the Scriptures of Almighty God. Number one, they are inspired or God-breathed. In other words, they came from the very mind of God. We read in the second chapter of the book of Acts in verse 4 that the apostles began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. He gave them the very message. The Scriptures are also authoritative since they provide doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. The Word of God is the authority for all that we teach and all that we practice. And then number three, the Scriptures are complete since they completely furnish man unto every good work, since they give us everything that we need. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But then, in the second place, the principles that must be acted upon and must be followed in the restoration of New Testament Christianity is that we must seek the old church. We must seek the old church. I want to tell you something. When you open up the pages of the New Testament, you don't read anything like attend or join the church of your choice. You don't read anything about that. But here's what you do read. You read that Jesus Christ is the builder and the foundation of His church. It belongs to Him. Matthew chapter 16, He had come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and He asked His disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They began to speak up. Well, some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say that you're Elijah, one of the prophets, John the Baptist. And so he asked them, Whom say ye that I am? And it was then that Simon Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now listen to me. It was then that Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus Christ promised to build His church not upon Peter, but upon that bedrock of truth that Peter had just confessed. The fact that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of the living God. He would be the foundation of the church. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, even Jesus Christ. But then here, here's another truth. I also find that the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. Now let me tell you, I'm well aware of the fact that there are many today who say that Jesus came into the world to establish, his kid, to establish His kingdom. But people weren't ready yet. People were not prepared to receive Him as King. So He decided to set up His church or to establish His church as a substitute, as somewhat of an afterthought. There's only one problem with that, and that is, that is completely foreign to the New Testament. Listen to Matthew 16, 18, and 19. I want you to notice this now. You read the terms church and kingdom used by the Lord interchangeably in the very same breath, very same context. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now I give unto you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so then, the church and the kingdom are one and the same institution. But then I find that the church was built upon the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus told His disciples about some things that were going to happen, that were going to take place that would let them know that what was taking place on that day was the fulfillment of prophecy, like the coming of the kingdom into existence. Well, 
in Mark 9 and verse 1, He said to them, Verily I say unto thee, There be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now listen to it. He said, Some of you standing here, those that He was talking to, are still going to be living when you've seen the kingdom of God come with power. But then, in Acts 1 and verse 8, well, back up in Luke 24, starting with verse 46, Jesus said, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And He goes on to tell His apostles, Tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem, listen to this, until ye be endued with power from on high. In Acts 1 and verse 8, he's still talking to his apostles. And he tells them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, you look at chapter 2, starting with verse 1, and when they were all assembled with one accord in one place, they, that is the apostles, there came from he heaven suddenly a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house wherein they were sitting. And there appeared unto them, the apostles, cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, that is the apostles, and they, the apostles, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them, the apostles, utterance. The power came upon them just as the Lord said that it would. But I also find that Christ is the head of the church. And He's the only head of the church. That doesn't leave any room for a pope or anybody else to assume to, to presume to be the head of the church on earth or anywhere else for that matter. In, May, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Jesus said, Paul rather said, that God gave Christ to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. In Colossians 1 and verse 18, Paul said, And He, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. And as the head of the church, all authority resides in Him. He doesn't share it with anyone else. He said in Matthew 28 and verse 18, All authority has been given unto me both in heaven and on earth. But then I find that the church is the one body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the church and the body are one and the same. And then Ephesians 4 and verse 4, there is one body. And then in Acts 2, 47, I learned that the saved are added to the church. You don't read in the New Testament of an individual becoming saved at one point and then becoming a member of the church at some other point later in time. But rather they were saved in being added and added in being saved. That's what Luke is saying when he says in Acts 2.47, And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. But then... We must seek the old name. We must seek the old name. Now, I know that there are people who say that there's nothing in a name. Well, there is something in a name. Peter writes, and Peter stated in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is something in a name. And inasmuch as there's something in a name, there is a name that has been given by the Lord to His people. And that is the name Christian. Christian. In Acts 11 and verse 26, Luke says, And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I'll tell you something about that word called. The word translated called. It's not a common word that is used like if someone else calls you something this is actually a word meaning to be commanded from heaven in other words god gave the name peter says in first peter chapter 4 verse 16 
If any of you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but rather let him glorify God in this name. If I've obeyed the gospel, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Church of Christ Christian, and I'm certainly not a Church of Christer or a Church of Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the church that I read about in the New Testament. But then God has also given a name to the Lord's body or, or various designations. You know, it, it surprises some to learn that there is actually not a single proper name that the Lord has given to His people collectively. Oftentimes, it is simply called the church as we read in Acts 11 and verse 22. And you read throughout the book of Acts and many, many times that's what it's called. The church. Sometimes it is referred to as the body of Christ as in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27. Sometimes it is called the kingdom of God's dear Son. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Congregations are called churches of Christ. Romans chapter 16 and verse 16. But then we must seek the old worship. We must seek the old worship. Now I know that there are many today who, who argue that it doesn't really make any difference how you worship God as long as your heart's right. As long as you're sincere. Well, I want to know what the Lord teaches. Now if I'm going to worship Him, then I need to find out what He says about worship. Not what somebody else says. Not what somebody else thinks. I want to know what the Lord says about it. So, look at this. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, Jesus is discussing worship with the Samaritan woman who is by Jacob's well. And He says, The hour cometh in which the true worshipers, note that true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Note that. The Father seeketh such. That modifies worship, true worshipers. So the Father wants true worshipers to worship Him. Well, the question may be then, what is, what is true worship? What, who are true worshipers? Look at verse 24. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must, and you stop there, that word must is very important. Now, if the Lord had said may, well, that might have made a difference in, in, uh, in that I could choose what I want to do. But He didn't say may or might. He said must. That's a word of obligation. In other words, if I'm going to worship the Lord, then it has got to be as He says in His Word. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. Now, spirit has to do with the character of the worship or the attitude of the one who worships. In other words, yes, I must be sincere. My heart has got to be in the worship if it's going to be acceptable to God. So, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. But the Lord didn't stop there. Let me tell you something. He said, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and... That word and is important also. Now in English, the word and is a coordinating conjunction. A coordinating conjunction brings together or unites two things of equal value, equal rank. In other words, spirit is no more important than truth. Truth is no more important than spirit. They are both equally important. So, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That is, according to the truth. Or as the truth instructs. In John 17, 17, in His prayer to the Father, Jesus said, Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So to worship God in truth means that I worship Him according to the way that He directs in His Word. I want to tell you something. The New Testament describes no roads 
no rituals, no ceremony, no offering of incense, no mechanical instruments of music. It doesn't describe those things anywhere. And if I presume to do any of those things, then it has got to be without the authority of Christ. Since he says nothing about those things in the New Testament. It's a point that we need to think about and understand. And then finally, we must seek the old plan of salvation. The old plan of salvation. What did the people do in the New Testament in order to be saved? What did they do? All right, now look at this. When I open up the pages of the New Testament, I can search through and through, and I never find anything about attending the church of your choice or joining the church of your choice. I do read something about the church of Christ's choice because that's the one that He established on the first Pentecost following His resurrection. I don't read anything about people saying the sinner's prayer. I don't even read that term, sinner's prayer, in the New Testament. I don't read anything about an individual being told to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I don't read anything about asking the Lord to come into your heart. Now if I read that in the New Testament, then that's what I need to do. Because remember, we have to go back to the old guide, the New Testament, our sole authority for everything that we teach, everything that we practice. So if I find anything like that in here, then I need to do it. But here's what I do find. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when the people ask, what must we do? Or what shall we do? In verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. When you look at verse 41, you find that they didn't misunderstand it. They understood what he said. And 3,000 people made the decision to obey. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. There were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Look at another example of conversion. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, starting with verse 26, Philip teaches the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. They're traveling along in the chariot after Philip has joined himself to that chariot. And the eunuch has been studying Isaiah 53, prophecies about Jesus and the sacrifice or the death of Christ. And so... The eunuch asked Philip, how can I understand this except some man guide me? I need some help here. I need some help. I need, I need you to explain this. So Philip begins at that same Scripture and preaches unto him Jesus. And the very next thing that I read is they come to a certain body of water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Where did he get the idea he needed to be baptized? Well, when Philip preached Jesus to him, he had to have preached baptism because baptism is a part of the likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Romans 6, verses 1 through 6. And then Philip said, If you believe with all of your heart, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They command the chariot to stand still. They go down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and Philip baptizes him. And then he rejoices. The eunuch does. And then a third example. In Acts 18 and verse 8, Paul came to the city of Corinth and he preached. And then this is what we read in verse 8, in verse 8 of Acts 18 about the Corinthians. Many of the Corinthians hearing, that is they heard Paul's preaching, hearing, believed, and were baptized. 
they believed and were baptized. Where did they get the idea they needed to be baptized? Because the same apostle that taught them that day is the one that wrote again in Romans chapter 6 about our being united with Christ through baptism. Romans 6, 1 through 6. The old plan of salvation. We speak where the Bible speaks and we are silent where the Bible is silent. We do Bible things in Bible ways and we call Bible things by Bible names. The restoration of simple New Testament Christianity. If you're not a Christian, we encourage you to obey the gospel. Again, in the very same way that those people did that we mentioned a moment ago. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 18. Upon believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you're an unfaithful child of God, come back to Him today, this morning, right now, for repentance and prayer as we stand and